Good day, everybody, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. Please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-2021 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. It is my honor and privilege today to welcome our speaker, Dr. David Van Essen, the Alumni Endowed Professor of Neuroscience at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Van Essen completed his um, bachelor's degree in chemistry in 1967 from the California Institute of Technology. And in 1971, he completed his PhD in neurobiology from Harvard Medical School. His professional experience includes postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard Medical School, uh, the University of Oslo, and University of College of, of London in England. Since 1992, he has been based at Washington University in St. Louis, where he has cultivated an impressive and successful career in human and non-human brain anatomy. His model of the, hum the primate visual system is now enshrined in the historical canon of neuroscience, and he has made immense contributions to the field of neuroinformatics. Uh, the sharing of primary data and the processing of neuroimaging data, in particular, the computational modeling and detailed mapping of the brain's cortical surface. Importantly, in partnership with Dr. Camille Ugerbill of the University of Minnesota, Dr. Van Essen leads the NIH-funded Human Connectome Project, a massive scale effort to map the extent and the structural and functional connectivity of the brain using neuroimaging methods. As a consequence of all his important work to understand the brain and the role of computational approaches in so doing, Dr. Van Essen has received numerous awards, acknowledgements, and recognition from leading scientific organizations in the US as well as internationally. He's also held many major leadership positions helping to direct research policy and practice for the brain, its informatics, and computation. His lecture today is entitled Mapping Structure, Function, and Connectivity in Humans and Non-Human Primate Cerebral Cortex. As always, we are streaming this lecture live uh, for recording via YouTube. If you're watching via YouTube, uh, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Also uh, for our specially selected 2020-2021 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants, you are encouraged to submit any questions for Dr. Van Essen via the chat feature in your Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and I will ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of Dr. Van Essen's lecture. And with that, welcome, David. We are very much looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Jack, for that generous introduction and for the chance to talk to you about the cerebral cortex and structure, function, and connectivity issues that I've been engaged in for many years now. I'd like to start with some big questions about how does the brain work to make us unique as a species, unique as individuals, gifted with amazingly diverse talents, unfortunately afflicted by devastating brain disorders at all ages and stages of the lifespan. And I think we can all agree that deciphering the brain in health and disease is truly a grand challenge for this century, if not the millennium beyond. I also want to emphasize in this talk how there's increasing dependence on data science to move the needle forward in uh, ch these challenging issues. So I'm going to focus on healthy brains and the cerebral cortex and the neuroinformatics aspects of how we tackle these issues. I'd like to start with some basic numbers. I love uh, anatomy and numbers about the brain. We all have about three pounds of squishy tissue inside our skull and the brain contains uh, almost 100 billion neurons. The dominant structure, whether you look at it from the lateral aspect or uh, the, a slice through from a coronal plane or a medial aspect of one hemisphere, the dominant structure is the cerebral cortex, which contains about 80% of brain mass if you count the gray matter and white matter together. Uh, and it is, of course, responsible for an enor enormous diversity of, of functions, cognitive, sensory, perceptual, motor, and so on. Uh, it does its job using only about 20% of the brain's total number of neurons, and that's because it's a uh, chock-a-block full of 10,000 or so synapses per neuron and 150 trillion or so grand total. The white matter cabling uh, linking one gray matter region to another uh, contains on the order of 160,000 kilometers worth of myelinated axons. The pint-sized cerebellum on the lower left uh, is only about 10% of the brain's mass, yet it contains an amazing 80% of the neuronal total. And it works in coordination with cerebral cortex and other circuits to coordinate our movements and also our thoughts. 
The rest of the brain uh, is less than 10% of brain mass, uh, contains fewer than 1% of all the neuronal counts, uh, and it in, contains literally hundreds of uh, subcortical nuclei and subnuclei that are collectively responsible for a, quite a wide variety of critically important housekeeping functions to, to handle our uh, thirst and hunger and many other uh, drives and behaviors. So for this talk, we're gonna start with some basics about cortical cartography, how we make maps, uh, past and present, uh, how we look at cortical connectivity in animal models. The second big chunk will be on the Human Connectome Project that Jack has already introduced. Uh, and then I'll talk about data sharing and neuroinformatics aspects before we wrap it up and uh, have time for questions. So our brains are about three times larger than that of our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. Uh, we're 15 times larger than the intensively studied macaque monkey that you'll hear more about. Uh, 200 times larger than the marmoset, uh, increasingly popular uh, experimental pr preparation for primate studies, and 2,000 times larger than the intensively studied uh, mouse brain. Uh, you can also see at a glance that the cortical convolutions vary enormously in the degree of folding and the pattern of folding. Uh, and it's those folds that made me a cortical cartographer when I started working almost 50 years ago on the macaque, macaque monkey cerebral cortex. And I took a cue from cartographers of the earth surface where we take a, uh, a corrugated uh, spherical surface the, of the earth and flatten it out and display on maps of the earth, flat maps, uh, many different types of geographic, political and cultural and uh, economic uh, varieties of information. For the cerebral cortex, uh, when I started, uh, computers weren't up to the job. And so I literally had to invent a method using pencil and tracing paper to make the early uh, vintage flat maps of here, the, mount, the monkey cerebral cortex, where we showed uh, the geography by representing in gray the regions that are buried in sulci. But we could take these maps and represent uh, uh, information about the functional organization of, of the cerebral cortex by identifying various cortical areas based on information about function, architecture, connectivity, and or topography. And there were a few areas like primary visual cortex D1 and little red area MT in the middle uh, that were poster children because they could be identified uh, by any or all of these uh, different approaches and they gave pretty much the same answer. Uh, but most of the other areas on this, this map, although the borders were drawn sharply on, on the representation, uh, the data, uh, behind them was fuzzy and there was a lot of debate about what was one area or another. We'll come back to that because it's critically important to have maps as accurate as possible. We also, Dan Fellman and I looked in the early days uh, at the connectivity inferred from studies reported in the, the literature. And we identified at that time, hundreds of pathways just among the, the several dozen visual areas known at the time. And we posited this uh, hypothesis that the connectivity supported uh, the idea of a distributed hierarchy in which uh, various visual areas are early, middle or late stages of information processing. And we generated uh, a binary connectivity matrix uh, showing the presence or absence of pathways known at the time. We knew that connections varied in strength but didn't have any hard data on that. So we had to put that on hold, but you'll, we'll come back to that because it's very important. But to make progress in the field, it was really important to get better methods of map making. And when uh, structural uh, MRI imaging came on the scene in the 1990s, uh, various labs, ours included, started making cortical surface models using computational methods. And the leading methods nowadays is without question the free surfer method uh, pioneered by Bruce Fischel and colleagues. And uh, that method with high quality H human connectome project HCP data uh, lets us uh, capture uh, the outside and inner surfaces of the, of the cortical sheet 
of the cortical ribbon, and then to take the middle of that surface and make a, a geometric model that we, we can spin around and also inflate. So to, as we smooth it out, the regions that are darker uh, on the smooth surface were deeper in the original uh, 3D uh, brain. If we do this for many different individuals and take a look at uh, these issues of individual variability from one person to the next of healthy young adults, uh, we see that they aren't all the same. They're like different fingerprint patterns. And we can see those similarities and differences more easily by looking at uh, the inflated maps on the, the right, where again, the darker it is, the deeper it was in the 3D uh, original configuration. So in some regions, like the red arrow pointing to the central sulcus, everyone has the same sulcus in about the same region. But actually in most regions, uh, there's remarkable variability in the folding pattern from one person uh, to the next. And amazingly, that's true even in identical twins. So lo and behold, there's two pairs of twins here. Uh, it's very hard to tell until I give you the cheat sheet answer and, and you can uh, be informed that the left and right pairs here are uh, from two twin pairs. Uh, and there is actually some heritability when you look uh, very carefully, but what one is struck by is uh, the, the striking degree of differences even amongst uh, identical twins working with the same genetic instruction kit. Uh, another critically important uh, issue is that cortical areas uh, vary in size. So in this lower right panel, uh, the red outlines the primary visual cortex in the left and right uh, hemispheres from three different individuals. And you can see uh, these, these differences in size and it also uh, the differences in relation to uh, nearby folds. Uh, uh, that springs to mind a question of what is it that makes the cortex fold? And I have a story that I'm going to encapsulate down to a simple nutshell uh, summary. Uh, I hypothesized some years ago, and I'm currently revisiting this, uh, the idea that mechanical tension along the axons that connect one region to another across long distances, if those axons are under mechanical tension, they may be the physical force that drives the, the folding uh, in a systematic way. But I'm going to skip over further discussion of that and move ourselves on to the question of uh, cortical connectivity, returning to what I schematized a little while back. Uh, when we looked at uh, original uh, brain maps. Uh, in order to look at the connectivity systematically, we need better, more accurate maps of the underlying cortical organization. So I mentioned that the map on the upper left uh, was an initial pro approximation. Uh, there are more recent models, uh, including a 91 area parcellation uh, shown in the upper right uh, based on cortical architecture. Uh, another one that contains 164 areas uh, by a different investigator, Paxinos. Uh, some years ago, we synthesized a hybrid across uh, several different uh, data sets and, and generated what we call a composite map. Uh, but the reality is uh, for the macaque monkey, we still don't have an accurate uh, map of uh, all the cortical areas. Uh, and we'll see in contrast, there's been more progress on in other species, the mouse and human uh, to, to be uh, specific. Uh, but using the parcellations at hand, we can look more closely at these issues of cortical connectivity by taking a tracer injection uh, as shown here for an example area. If we inject a retrograde tracer into cortical area 7A and then slice up the brain postmortem, the red dots in the next panel here show the location of retrogradely labeled cells uh, at various distances across each slice. And when we uh, stack those together and assign the total number of, area of labeled cells uh, for each cortical area, we get on the lower left a quantitative map colorized uh, to show the density of inputs uh, from different cortical areas to the injected area 7A. This is actually a logarithmic plot. And on the, the lower right, uh, you see that there's an amazingly systematic log normal uh, distribution such that the, the strongest connections on the upper left are literally five orders of magnitude 
uh, more dense than neuronal inputs, then the weakest connection is coming from the lower right. So this is a basic principle that holds for all cortical areas that have been examined. Uh, we can also take uh, data that's currently available from 29 injected areas out of this 91 area parcellation and see a, now a quantitative connectivity matrix that gives us uh, a, a much more accurate uh, assessment of the, uh, the, the wiring uh, that underlies uh, cortical circuits and brain function. Uh, there's still need to uh, assess this using even more accurate um, methods that are what we call parcellation free and getting those more accurate connectivity maps is something our lab is currently doing in collaboration with Henry Kennedy in France. Uh, if we take the same issue and apply it for the mouse brain that I alluded to uh, a few moments ago, uh, in the upper panel there you see a top-down view of both hemispheres of the smooth brain glissencephalic uh, mouse cortex, much smaller, much smoother. Uh, and Andreas Burkhalter has pioneered the process of taking that smooth brain and literally physically flattening it, not computationally, but squishing it between glass slides and then cutting uh, the brain, the smoothed out cortex uh, uh, tangentially and using anatomical methods, he's been able to identify 41 distinct uh, cortical areas. And we think this is actually pretty close to a ground truth estimate of the uh, parcellation into many dis distinct areas, but not nearly as many as in primates. Uh, and uh, working in, uh, also with Henry Kennedy, Andreas and Berkhalter and colleagues have identified uh, even richer, denser connectivity within the cortical network in the mouse. So nearly all areas are connected with all other areas. The only ones that have no connections are the, the scattered ones shown in black there. So the, the cortex is in this sense, a densely connected distributed network. Also, amazingly, it's now possible to reconstruct uh, using different anatomical techniques, the full complexity of individual neurons. So in, in the red arrow, that's pointing to a single uh, labeled neuron in uh, motor cortex of the mouse. And uh, right next to the arrow, you can see that the distribution of the dendritic arbors in the immediate vicinity, but then branching out uh, is a single axon that branches profusely and makes a huge number of connections on both the ipsilateral and contralateral side. So this gives you a sense of what individual neurons are doing. And now think of billions of them uh, finding their pathways and uh, setting up shop and communicating with one another, it gives you an idea of the staggering complexity uh, that we have to grapple with in trying to understand how any uh, brain works. And that brings me in, into uh, an exciting modern world of connectomics, the principle of systematically looking uh, at connectivity as comprehensively as possible. Uh, but we have to put that comprehensive in quotes because uh, uh, the challenges of working with uh, the scales from microscopic to macroscopic uh, pose uh, uh, exciting, uh, daunting, but uh, also uh, challenges that can be tackled. So there's an exciting world of the so-called microconnectome that strives to use electron microscopy and other ultra high resolution methods to identify every single uh, synapse, axon, dendrite, glial cell, cell body, the whole kit and caboodle and reconstruct that uh, uh, as extensively and accurately as possible. And there has been uh, uh, exciting progress and success in reconstructing the microconnectome uh, for up to a cubic millimeter uh, already and in the offing in the decade or so to come is the prospect of reconstructing the entire mouse brain at the microconnectum level. So that will be uh, uh, very exciting and, and something to, from a data science uh, perspective uh, to salivate about uh, the, the ways to explore that using sophisticated uh, uh, tools. 
there is in parallel this uh, second world of what uh, I like to call the mesoconnectome using the kinds of pathway tracers that I've already illustrated, looking at local and long distance connectivity across the whole uh, brain at a uh, uh, light microscopic resolution uh, to identify connectivity uh, in experimental um, animals, the mouse and uh, marmoset and macaque monkey in included. Uh, I currently live uh, most of my research time in the macro connectome world of human neuroimaging where we use uh, MRI based methods for the most part uh, to uh, infer what we can about structure function and connectivity uh, in living human brains with the, the resolution element, the voxels we work with, uh, generally being on the order of a millimeter or two on a side. Uh, and bear in mind uh, that each cubic millimeter contains literally hundreds of thousands of neurons and millions and millions of uh, uh, synapses. So uh, our resolution uh, has to uh, uh, cope with, with, with those anatomical realities. So, uh, but that's the realm of the human connectome project to which we'll now turn our connection. But I, I wanna say a little bit more. Uh, well, actually we're gonna jump right through the human connectome project now. So, a, dec a decade ago, uh, the NIH funded two uh, human connectome projects. Uh, Jack was involved with one uh, uh, UCLA, then USC working with Mass General Hospital. I was involved with the Washington University, Minnesota and Oxford consortium where we uh, aspired to get data on brain structure function and connectivity uh, in 1200 healthy adult twins and their siblings using state-of-the-art scanners, improved pulse sequences to get higher quality data and getting an unprecedented four hours worth of multimodal imaging data from each subject. Uh, we ended up uh, successfully getting data on 1,100 subjects scanned with the three Tesla scanner at WashU. Uh, 200 of those subjects also flew up to Minnesota and were scanned at higher resolution with a seven Tesla scanner. Uh, 100 of the uh, participants uh, went over to St. Louis University and got uh, magnetoencephalography scanning, which is exciting because it gives much higher resolution in time, but at the price of uh, coarser uh, resolution in space. But it, it's, it is another complementary modality. In addition, we got extensive behavioral demographic and genotyping data uh, to buttress uh, the imaging data that I'll be mainly focused on. Uh, when we analyzed the data, we developed and uh, consolidated a, a set of pre-processing pipelines that uh, are absolutely critical for taking full advantage of the high quality imaging data that we were able to acquire. And uh, I'll illustrate how we were able to achieve improved alignment across subjects, uh, map to more accurate atlases, and bring powerful visualization tools, including the Connectome Workbench platform that my lab has spearheaded. Uh, and we developed advanced analysis methods for looking at uh, the relationships between connectivity and behavior and looking at more accurate cortical parcellations that I'll uh, illustrate in a short while. Another key issue is our uh, enthusiasm about sharing the data as, as well as the methods and tools. Uh, I'll illustrate the Connectome DB uh, uh, database for sharing the primary and minimally pre-processed data as well as the BALSA database uh, that facilitates uh, uh, sharing of uh, uh, highly analyzed data. And almost 20,000 inves investigators have signed on to using the, the data and uh, more than a thousand publications uh, have emerged to date uh, using this data sets. Uh, the, the neuroimaging paradigm that we introduce as we develop uh, uh, these, these methods and, and analysis strategies uh, are summarized with seven core ten tenets that uh, are published in uh, Nature Neuroscience uh, paper that I encourage people to look at. Uh, the first of them is, uh, I've touched on before, uh, it's really important to get as much neuroimaging data as one can in any given study subject to practical constraints of costs and, and 
uh, subject tolerance, but uh, it needs you not only a lot of data, but multiple modalities so that they can complement one another. And for each mo modality, uh, it's really important to get the highest spatial resolution possible, uh, given again, scanner and other practical limits, uh, and to pay attention to other uh, aspects of data quality. We found that the multiband uh, MRI for functional and diffusion imaging uh, is extremely important in essentially providing more bang for the buck, uh, uh, getting more data uh, uh, per, uh, per second uh, yields uh, uh, excellent benefits. Once the data is acquired, it's really important to minimize the distortions which lurk in uh, uh, most modalities of, of the data and also be uh, attentive to not blurring the data so as not to waste the high quality of resolution that one uh, acquired. Another important principle is to respect the geometry of brain structures. And by that, I mean, uh, for the cerebral cortex, uh, you've already seen uh, visually the benefits of using surface models. Uh, and that's all well and good, but for the subcortical structures, which lurk inside the cortical uh, core, uh, uh, it's really important to use uh, volume elements, uh, voxels, and we developed a, a hybrid representation that we call the SIFTI format uh, that uh, combines the benefits of both uh, approaches and an efficient strategy. Once one has data uh, as analyzed as carefully as possible uh, across individuals, it's really important to align the data precisely across individuals and across studies. And, and, and that's not, has not been uh, traditionally done with conventional volume-based imaging, but I'll illustrate the benefits uh, of doing it carefully. And uh, when the data have been analyzed, uh, uh, it's really important to use accurate brain parcellations uh, to the degree that's feasible for any given species. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, the principle of freely sharing the data uh, from the raw to minimally pre-processed to publication related uh, is uh, critically important and is now much more feasible than it was uh, a few years ago. So let me illustrate uh, by a few examples uh, why it's so important uh, and valuable to get high quality data and, and process it carefully. So when Matt Glasser came to my lab uh, more than a decade ago, he had actually noticed uh, uh, anecdotally that in a conventional T1 weighted image, such as this uh, horizontal slice through the top of a brain, that in the cortical gray matter ribbon, uh, some regions uh, are a little bit darker than average, other regions are a little bit brighter than average. And uh, very importantly, if you take a T2 weighted image uh, that looks uh, like this next slice here, uh, it has essentially the opposite uh, contrast. Uh, the CSF is bright, the gray matter is gray, and the white matter is dark. Uh, but in that gray matter ribbon, the region that had been uh, darker in a T1 weighted is now brighter in the T2 and vice versa for the, the uh, other example region. So by taking the ratio of that uh, and colorizing it, uh, it canceled out some uh, uh, inconvenient um, uh, biases and allowed for more accurate mapping of uh, the T1 to T2 ratio onto the cortical ribbon, uh, which revealed a pattern that was uh, strikingly similar to uh, myelin maps that had been evident from classical uh, brain studies. So the sensory motor strip, uh, auditory cortex, and uh, visual area MT are all known to be heavily myelinated and they show up with, with a high T1 to T2 ratio. So it's not a perfect quantitative marker, but it's a qualitatively extremely useful, uh, especially if one aligns accurately across uh, many subjects, one gets these kind of beautiful myelin maps that you see uh, on the left panels here. Uh, and uh, in the same subjects, uh, one can also get a different anatomical marker of cortical thickness as shown in the, the middle panel. Uh, the right panel shows the range of thickness uh, from uh, uh, over about a twofold range from less than two to uh, up to four millimeters. And so each of these patterns uh, gives us uh, strong indications 
of regional differences. And by taking the spatial gradient and computing that and analyzing it carefully, one can identify uh, aerial features and uh, prospective aerial boundaries that run along what we call gradient ridges. Uh, and one can use that to identify just with these two anatomical methods, some cortical areas, uh, but in the bluish uh, and indigo regions, uh, the fluctuations in myelin and thickness are, are more gradual and uh, less revealing about functional organization. So that uh, comes back to this point, why do we need many modalities? Uh, uh, it's informative in many ways and including for the issue of cortical parcellation that we'll come back to uh, in a short while. Uh, but let's take a look at these other modalities, starting with diffusion imaging and then um, after touching on that briefly, looking at uh, a second modality of functional MRI. So uh, with diffusion imaging, the action is mainly in the white matter. Uh, and as you may know, uh, the diffusion and coding ingredients are structured in such a way they probe uh, the, the, for the orientation or axis on which water diffuses most freely, most rapidly. And that correlates with the orientation of uh, axons, fiber bundles in the white matter. So for each little voxel uh, of one and a quarter millimeters we were able to get for the HCP, one can estimate the dominant orientation, but also a probe for evidence of whether there are crossing fiber bundles uh, which is hugely important because there are uh, indeed many uh, fiber bundles crisscrossing throughout the white matter organization. And then one can uh, use probabilistic tractography methods to infer trajectories of fiber bundles, uh, including those that are cr crossing through uh, any given voxel. So one can uh, carry out this tractography approach to estimate long distance connections from one seed region in the, the blue dot shown in the example uh, to other regions. And one can infer uh, gray matter to gray matter connectivity as shown in, uh, by the reddish regions uh, in the lower right panel here. So it's exciting that one can get information indicative of trajectories within the white matter and uh, gray matter to gray matter connectivity. Uh, but uh, lurking under these pretty pictures are some uh, uh, hard nosed realities, uh, which in a nutshell are that there are many false positives and false negatives and systematic biases, even in the best tractography data uh, to date. And so one has to be extremely careful uh, to um, not overinterpret. Uh, the data that comes uh, from this. And it's a really complex issue. If you have more questions, I'd be happy to uh, touch on them further in the discussion period. Uh, but in the interest of uh, time, let's move on to uh, uh, functional MRI, which comes in two flavors. The first of them is the, the, the conventional task evoke functional fMRI to use uh, a structured task to uh, modulate uh, uh, oxygen consumption, uh, and uh, the so-called uh, bold blood oxygen level dependent signal uh, that fMRI yields. And Deanna Barch pioneered, spearheaded how we approach this with the uh, HCP project. In the hours worth of time allocated to task fMRI, we carried out seven different tasks. I'm gonna very quickly illustrate three of them. A language task, listening to stories in the scanner versus doing arithmetic mentally. Uh, a social cognition task, uh, looking at moving triangles and saying, are they moving randomly or are they hugging and kissing and dancing in a way that one infers social interactions amongst these icons. Lastly, a working memory task uh, is the image you see right now, uh, the same or different from what you saw uh, two uh, images two back ago. We're gonna uh, fly through this looking at uh, maps of functional MRI task evoked signals uh, on maps of the cortical surface that have been smoothed out on the left, uh, brain slices and mapped to a cerebellar flat map on the right panels. So here's what happens listening to stories versus a baseline. You see the reddish and yellow uh, regions of high activation in temporal and frontal cortex, uh, evident in a, a symmetric pattern in both hemispheres, though stronger on the left. 
uh, hot, hot spots indicated by the arrows. Also in the cerebellum is uh, got language related uh, regions as well. If you take the next task in line, the social versus random that I mentioned, you see there's partial overlap. Some of the regions are strongly activated by both tasks, uh, but many other regions are activated in the, the social versus random that are not seen in the, in the, task, in the language activation. Uh, and the third quick example uh, is the working memory tasks. Uh, that's more complementary, uh, but still a bit of overlap. But basically, uh, the long and short of it uh, that we have time to touch on here is that for any given task that you're doing in the scanner or in your daily uh, activities, it invokes a complex uh, set of partially overlapping and dynamic networks, not just one hotspot when you're thinking about what's two plus two and another hotspot for seven minus four and, and so on. It, it's, it's a very divergent, uh, uh, complex network, uh, in some ways uh, akin to the complexity of network uh, of anatomical connectivity I've illustrated in the first part of the talk. Uh, switching over to our uh, next major and last major modality, uh, resting state fMRI. If one lies in the scanner and thinks about who won the game, how is the debate, what for dinner, uh, what are we going to do tomorrow, uh, the brain is very active uh, and uh, that's uh, those fluctuations that occur uh, can be probed uh, in a, uh, a systematic way by taking any uh, pair of gray matter regions, gray ordinates as we call them, looking at the time uh, signature, uh, the fluctuations, and asking for each pair of all possible pairs, are they correlated, anti-correlated, or where in between? And that can be converted into a functional connectivity matrix as we call it, uh, also a dense functional connectome by another lingo. That, that we can see as a, this matrix, or we can probe it, interrogate it one row or column at a time and say for seed region one, uh, who is it correlated with? And it turns out there's a systematic pattern consistent in broad strokes with the anatomical uh, patterns we've seen in the, in the monkey. Uh, regions that are close to the seed region tend to be more likely to be correlated, but some long distance regions are highly correlated as well on the same as well as opposite hemispheres. And for another seed region, you see a different uh, pattern and one can uh, milk that for many good purposes, uh, even recognizing that this uh, functional connectivity measure is really highly indirect and assuredly is by not the same uh, in a quantitative uh, sense as uh, tracer-based anatomical connectivity. Something we're very interested in, but I don't have time to talk about it, but you can ask me later if you're interested. So how can we use these multiple types of information uh, for interesting analyses? I don't have time only to talk about one that's my favorite, which is the issue of cortical parcellation that you've heard about already. Uh, in other species, if we come to this uh, for the human brain, uh, we're uh, bequeathed with a century-old uh, classic map based on just the cellular architecture or cytochrome architecture that uh, the great German anatomist Brodmann painted onto uh, a surface model or a, a surface drawing. Uh, also a century ago, uh, working in parallel, a Cecil and Otto Vogt identified uh, almost 200 areas uh, in, using myelin sayings versus Brodmann's map of 50 areas. And for a century, uh, the, the debate uh, followed as to which one was more likely to be accurate. Uh, in recent decades, uh, MRI has uh, chimed in with uh, indications of uh, functional connectivity maps giving uh, evidence for network organization uh, of an intermediate kind of pattern. Uh, Randy Buckner's lab uh, has provided one parcellation shown in the, the lower left panel. Steve Peterson's lab has uh, produced an even finer grain uh, uh, model, uh, but uh, that's incomplete and uh, also not as symmetric across hemispheres as one might expect. Uh, but these uh, fMRI-based, uh, essentially unimodal parcellations uh, uh, represent 
uh, major forward progress, uh, but don't provide a consensus within themselves. And when Matt Glasser and I uh, focus more intensely on the HCP data, uh, we found that it was possible to get more accurate parcelation by taking uh, advantage of the multiple modal uh, types of data you've already seen, look, looking for information about architecture as well as topography and connectivity and function in combination and to let regions be defined uh, when there's consistency uh, of uh, gradient ridges be, uh, that agree across modalities, uh, then we were more confident that uh, we were on the right track. Uh, and as you'll see briefly, that uh, proved to be successful, not only for getting a group average uh, parcellation, but for individual subjects as well. So to cut to the chase after an intense uh, and very focused analysis, Matt was able to identify 180 cortical areas in the left hemisphere, a matching set uh, in, of 180 areas in the right hemisphere, functionally organized by uh, broad uh, color schemes uh, to show regions related to vision, sensory motor, auditory, or more cognitive regions as uh, colorized on the map. Uh, we gave each of these areas labels, 83 of them agreed uh, with classical names in the literature, so we just, just kept with the same name. 97 of them uh, were finer grain or entirely new, uh, and so that uh, summed up the total, uh, as you see on the map there. Uh, Matt was able to apply an aerial classifier algorithm to identify these areas in, in all individuals and show that they vary in size, shape, and precise location. So just give you a quick flavor of that. Here's a group average parcellation laid, overlaid on a group average myelin map. Uh, here's one individual subject's parcellation overlaid on its own subject uh, parcellation uh, and myelin map. Here's one particular area. Here in another individual, you can see the same area, but it doesn't have the precisely same uh, location. Uh, 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 another group, Alan and Tijevich and uh, Michael Cole, were able to take the, the HCP data and identify uh, functional resting state networks of the type that uh, the Buckner and Peterson labs had previously uh, pioneered, but now uh, using uh, Matt's parcellation to identify 12 distinct uh, resting state networks in the human brain uh, as assessed by this approach. Uh, so uh, in the last few minutes, let me move on to uh, these exciting and really important issues of uh, neuroinformatics aspects of, uh, uh, that we're coming from here. And I wanna start with one that builds off the cortical parcellation that I just saw you because I just showed you. A lot of people have been interested in, in not just seeing the pretty pictures in a nature paper, but actually working with these uh, data sets, the, the parcellation itself and the, and, and the functional uh, and other modalities of maps. And we made it really easy for people to do that. If you uh, literally uh, look at the online uh, uh, journal and uh, look at the figure legend, there's a little URL sitting there. And if you click on that, you jump immediately over to our BALSA database, uh, which gives you a preview uh, of that same uh, figure and basically uh, uh, lets you tap into this by logging on to Valsa, which is easy, and just saying, I'd like to, uh, after I agreed to the, the data use terms, I'd like to download that data set. And lo and behold, you can download uh, the data and launch Connect on Workbench and replicate that very same figure uh, and work with the data and the subsets uh, that you want for your, your own analyses. And you can take uh, other, uh, as we call them, scene files that characterize uh, each of these uh, figures. Uh, and you can get a scene file with all the labels painted on the surface uh, for aid in identify, identifying one area versus another. Uh, so the BALSA database is now uh, encouraging investigators for uh, all neuroimaging uh, studies to uh, work with the Connect and Workbench scene file platform, upload your data, uh, and share it with the, with the, the community. And, and uh, over 2,200 users have tapped into the dozens of studies that are in the database so far, but we'd like to build that up 
uh, more aggressively in the, in the years to come. Uh, and uh, I emphasize that these scene files are useful not only for data sharing, uh, but for just in-house working with complex data sets and making uh, sophisticated, accurate uh, figure preparation. Uh, jumping over to the earlier stages of processing, Dan Marcus at WashU uh, spearheaded uh, the establishment of a robust Connectome DB uh, database that is uh, how we shared the, uh, particularly the minimally pre-processed HTTP data. Uh, and uh, the Connectome DB provides for uh, rapid, easy access uh, to various combinations of uh, data, pre-packaged data sets, or drilling down and searching for individual uh, subjects uh, or groups of subjects meeting a particular behavioral or imaging quality or other aspects of uh, the HCP uh, metadata that we provide uh, to work with uh, these data sets. And literally uh, 14 petabytes of data have been downloaded, downloaded by almost 20,000 uh, users uh, to work with the HCP data and generate the, the thousand plus publications I already alluded to. Uh, so uh, moving uh, forward from the original young adult HCP, which wrapped up in 2016, uh, there are many other projects that are uh, acquiring and sharing HCP style data that I've uh, touched upon. Uh, the lifespan projects in aging and development are going to be wrapping up uh, next spring uh, to provide and share data from more than a thousand uh, older adults for the aging projects and young children five to 21 for the uh, development project. Uh, a major release coming uh, in a month or so and then one final one at the end of the project. There are also uh, 14 what we call disease connectome projects uh, that are also in late stages of acquiring and uh, analyzing and sharing uh, data. Altogether, 4,000 subjects will be in this collection of uh, pro projects, uh, uh, each project dealing with a particular disorder, depression, psychosis, uh, and so on. And Dan Marcus and I have uh, spearheaded the Co Connectome Coordination Facility to handle the informatics for these, for processing them systematically with uh, HCP style pipelines and providing the data, making it ready for data sharing. I'll come back to the data sharing aspects in a moment, but I just want to touch upon a couple of others. Uh, the ABCD project is even more ambitious. It's a 10 year project to follow 12,000 kids uh, from nine uh, years uh, through uh, uh, the teenage decade. Uh, there's a baby connect home project uh, uh, that's got exciting uh, data on very young ages, a British uh, prenatal and uh, neonatal project uh, uh, the UK Biobank project, again, pushing another envelope, 100,000 subjects, uh, albeit with only 30 minutes of scan uh, per subject. So there's staggering amounts of neuroimaging data being acquired, shared, and, and, and analyzed. And one of the key uh, events recently uh, was an NIH decision uh, that data sharing uh, for these projects, rather than being localized in uh, institution-based repositories are in general going to be coming into a, a, a cloud-based NIMH data archive uh, and uh, an aspiration uh, that NIMH is pushing on uh, is that even for uh, smaller projects, uh, but projects of any side with imaging, genomic, and, uh, and other modalities of data uh, should be uh, planning to get their data into this uh, N NDA uh, archive. Uh, uh, there's some important issues to be worked out for the community to shift over to uh, the, this NDA cloud-based uh, domain. Uh, the data access isn't as straightforward as we, we were, had been able to make it for the young adult HCP, but it is manageable. Uh, and NIH is encouraging uh, investigators uh, to get uh, accustomed to working on the cloud for data analysis. Uh, that's going to be developing rapidly uh, in the years to come. And uh, I think the, the data science community that you guys represent can really play an invaluable service to the community in helping uh, uh, establish and 
that infrastructure and make it robust for a, a wide variety of, of analysis uh, strategies on the cloud, as well as what one can do by downloading the data and bring it into the laboratory environment. So to wrap it up, uh, in brief summary, we've seen evidence of the importance of looking at cortical parcellation, uh, great progress in uh, many species, particularly humans and mice. Uh, I've given you a, uh, uh, strong indications of how extraordinarily complex cortical connectivity is, uh, but it's an organized uh, set of networks in a distributed hierarchical configuration. Uh, neuroinformatics, which Jack and I have been engaged in for uh, literally decades, has gone from uh, a, an outlier uh, out in the boondocks uh, domain of science to a front burner exciting field of research that, again, you guys are uh, helping to spearhead. Uh, and uh, there's a tremendous amount to be done uh, using the new tools uh, applied to uh, these very rich uh, data sets, particularly the HCP style that I've emphasized uh, gives a lot of value added for studying development, aging, brain disorders, uh, and will give us uh, progress in the future. So one quick analogy, just to drive uh, some of these points home, uh, we have classical maps of the earth and the brain, book atlases and uh, the brain and earth. Satellite imagery was revolutionary. MRI is revolutionary for brain imaging. Google Earth, as you know, has been utterly transformative. Uh, that and other technologies for navigating at uh, an immense range of, range of scales uh, uh, seamlessly uh, and, and literally at your fingertips. Uh, we look forward to continued exciting project progress in, in the field of comics to let us navigate the brain at the, the immense range of spatial scales that are needed to decipher uh, its organization and function. So what I've been able to tell you about is uh, due to uh, tremendous efforts by people in my lab, uh, our collaborators, Henry and Takuya, uh, a fantastic team of individuals for the young adult HCP and the successor lifespan projects and the generous support of, of, of uh, funding agencies. So I'd be happy to discuss any questions that you may have. David, thank you so much for sharing with us this. Really, it's a tour de force amount of work to map the brain and its form and function, both from some of your early work that you, you summarized, but also this just impressive amount of science that has been born out of the Human Connectome Project and all of its uh, derivative projects. Um, it's just so exciting as a source for data and an opportunity for computational types to dive into that data, to model it, to uh, be able to synthesize it and turn it into to new knowledge. And I, I, I want to encourage our um, Innovation Lab participants to send in any chats that you have for Dr. Van Essen via the uh, Zoom chat feature. Um, while we're waiting for some of those to pile up, David, I want to ask you that kind of as you noted, I think it was kind of a general thread throughout your talk was that the brain possesses multiple scales of measurement and multiple scales of resolution um, from cells to systems, from synapses to cortical shapes, from you know time as well as spatial uh, aspects. And while many researchers tend to stick within their particular spatio-temporal slice of uh, area of research, what do you are you envisioning or can you tell from the Human Connectome Project what we need to do to actually transcend some of these scales of measurement and what sort of data science might be needed in order to do that? My short answer is I think it's a great opportunity uh, and my instincts are that we need literally a new approach, a new brand of computational strategies and, and data science to grapple uh, with uh, these utterly daunting, challenging, uh, but critical uh, issues of navigating across scales uh, in a way that captures uh, the way that the, these brain networks somehow mad, manage to work. Uh, I've been very interested in computational neuroscience uh, since literally uh, the mid 80s and have been excited to see uh, progress uh, on many fronts, including efforts uh, to, uh, to bridge this gap between micro, meso, and macro scales as we, uh, one of the ways we can parse that. But I also 
my feeling is uh, that we haven't really um, broken through uh, the ice and and gotten into uh, uh, a rich exploratory strategy that uh, yields uh, the, the 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 deep pay dirt. Uh, it, it's partly because we don't have the computational tools yet. Uh, there. I think there's tremendous room for innovation on strategies for modeling uh, complex networks that, that that have to be invented. I, I don't feel like it's just a matter of taking existing tools and, and running with it. Uh, we need smart uh, people uh, developing new computational strategies in conjunction uh, with the ability to cope with these staggering amounts of, of, of data that I've touched upon from these uh, multimodalities. Uh, so uh, I've, I've made the point uh, uh, okay, on occasion that when I was in the, uh, a student, a postdoc in the 1970s working with Hubel and Weasel, I had this absolute illusion that they had stolen or not stolen, they had just taken the, the, the cream of what's to be discovered in neuroscience and published it and got their Nobel Prize. And what was left for us to mop up was just uh, 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 leftovers. And nothing could be farther from the truth, I, I've come to realize. They deserve their Nobel Prize, they and many other pioneers. Uh, but what we have yet to understand about the brain keeps looming larger and larger. The more we know, the more there is to, that we really have to uh, uh, have yet to learn in terms of the data and uh, deciphering how it actually works. So it's tremendously exciting and will be so for, for literally decades to come. David, you've been involved with various aspects of the sharing of data for as long as I have known you. And the, there's a sociology behind sharing, which I think in the early days was almost uh, a just crippling. People were just so nervous about doing it. And now it almost seems like it's just expected that you do it. And I'm just curious if you have any war stories or uh, thoughts about <laughs> how data have kind of become fair as, you know, capital F-A-I-R, yeah. um, and what lessons you have learned from the Human Connect Dome project. Patience, I would say, is one of the things that you and I both had to learn because uh, I think we both acutely re recall those early days. It was an uphill battle, uh, and and we were, in another analogy, voices in the wilderness saying, "Hey, guys, it's really, really important to share data." And and uh, as you kind of alluded to, we would get anything from blank stares to shrug of the shoulders to resistance, hostility, I don't want to do it, don't bother me, to uh, I'd love to do it, I have no idea how, and indeed uh, knowing how back in those days was impractical. So I, I, I think you and I and many others have, have had to be patient uh, with uh, the the evolution of the methodology as well as the sociology uh, to where we now are at long last, uh, uh, a couple of decades later, uh, the, 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 the attitude is radically different uh, in, in the community, in the younger generation, and indeed is saying, of course we should share, and how do we do it, how do we help? But, uh, uh, taking the long view uh, it, uh, has been important for uh, folks like you and me. Well, uh, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, one final question before we wrap things up is, uh, what do you see as the role of the understanding of both structural and functional connectivity in understanding neurological disease? Uh, again, it's hugely important. Um, I think, you know, there have been hypotheses, for example, uh, that certain disorders, schizophrenia or autism, are exemplified by, quote, over-connectivity or under-connectivity, as suggested by uh, fMRI, particularly a resting state fMRI, or other uh, yeah, tractography as well. 
to me, those are, you know, a, a first crack at trying to uh, um, crack the nut and get down to the, the, the meat of the issue. I think it's exceedingly unlikely that the, the neurological disorders uh, will be explained in such a simple way. And that's one of the reasons why I'm uh, intensely interested in uh, exploring how one can take uh, resting state fMRI data as powerful and, uh, and enticing as it is and uh, probe it more deeply beyond just looking at simple correlations or even partial correlations, which we've tried and doesn't actually help as much as we might have hoped in kind of cleaning up the, the signal and, and getting better estimates of actual uh, wiring-like connectivity. So I think uh, we need animal models uh, and we need an intense commitment by the field to say, uh, we've got to go way past correlation and figure out somehow uh, using better data and better analysis strategies to infer uh, what does this, these, what do these signals tell us and how do we interpret them in much more nuanced and complicated, sophisticated ways as to what the uh, uh, malfunction dysfunctions are in brain disorders like autism, schizophrenia, and, and many others. David, with that, let me thank you very much for sharing uh, this amazing body of work with us and uh, giving us some words of wisdom as we uh, kind of undertake our own interests here in uh, neuroscience, uh, neuroimaging, neuroscience generally across spatial and temporal scales. Um, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate it and uh, want to wish everybody who's listening in a, a very good weekend. And uh, once again, Dr. Van Essen, thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure.